All right, so <laughs> welcome to uh, a little episode of Sci Fails we got going on here for you. It is going to be old hat, I guess you could say, but uh, with a new twist because I got some new information. Y'all might get tired of me talking about this, but this is one of the silliest and one of my favorite young earth creationist theories ever. Obviously, the fire breathing dinosaur uh, is in and of itself an amazing marvel of nature, but how does it work? Well, dipping back into the Hovind archives, as you saw with our 15 foot whale penis, uh, <laughs> Hovind's going to tell us about fire breathing dinosaurs. And then I'm going to look at this artic new article that uh, Mark Reed sent me. It's not new, I guess. Somebody that the uh, young earth creationist sent him to try to debunk. Let me tell you my reasons why, and then you can tell me all the reasons all right, you don't. Let me restart it. You say, come on, Brother Hovind, you believe in fire breathing dragons? Yeah. I got four reasons why I believe in them. Let me tell you my reasons why, and then you can tell me all the reasons you don't believe in them. I'll be glad to have a nice discussion with you about this. But reason number one, it's pretty hard to read that passage in the Bible without coming to the conclusion that this critter could breathe fire. Wouldn't you say that's the obvious... So, uh, reason one is, for the Bible tells me so. Uh, knocking that uh, apologia right out of the park. of that verse. Yeah. I mean, if you gave that to 5,000 people, all of them would come up with the same idea of what it's trying to say. Wouldn't it? That's the obvious interpretation. The Bible says the Creator could breathe fire. Secondly, there are hundreds of legends about fire-breathing dragons. Why do so many countries have legends about fire-breathing dragons? I mean, don't you think that's kind of a coincidence? If they're just making up the story, why didn't somebody have a fire-breathing hamster or something? Hmm? Why? Okay, so fire-breathing in dragons, like... Other dragon cult dragons in, in a lot of cultures did not breathe fire. Um, it was just very select and uh, a, a arrangement of uh, civilizations had fire breathing dragons. And there were fire there were other fire breathing creatures too. There were fire breathing birds and serpents. Um, yeah, I'm caffeinated. <laughs> caffeinated PZ. Oh, let's see. Why is it always fire-breathing dragon? Kind of a strange coincidence, don't you think? Thirdly, it is chemically possible to do this. To mix chemicals together and they burn their enemy. That's what Bombardier Beetle does. You can get world... Ah, uh, ring. Ring, there you go. A Bombardier Beetle does not blast fire. It does not blast... Uh, anything... It does, it's non-combusting, right? It does not combust. There's a chemical reaction... Uh, uh, which is a, a, you know, a lot of kinetic force, but it's not, it's not combusted. It's not on fire. It is hot. It's superheated from, uh, from pressure, from the, the pressure in the glands to, uh, fire it out. Now, uh, what is this substance? It's, uh, what did we, we got, we got, uh, hydroquinone and, uh, some other substances, uh, mixed together to, uh, make a hot stinging liquid. It's not fire. Uh, if you tell me that there was a dinosaur that could spray hot, uh, hot, uh, liquid or warm, <laughs> warm liquid or whatever, I'd be more likely to believe you than you say in one that, that actually breathed flames, that actually co uh, combusted. World Book Encyclopedia, Science Here, 81 edition, and read about the Bombardier Beetle. 81 edition. Okay. And just remember, I was born in 1983 and I am in my 40s. Okay, and I and this book is older than me that he's citing here. They've got this beetle glued down with peroxides. There you go. PZ's got my back. Peroxides and uh, hydroquinone. Um, quinone, hydroquinone. I think is how you say that. Uh, yep. They will. Uh, and it, they mix them together in a pressurized chamber, and it, uh, the pressure heats them up. And then they, it fires it out. Drop a yellow wax on his back and a paper clip stuck in there. He's clamped into a ring stand, so he'll cooperate for the photographer. And then they reached up with the tweezers and pinched his front leg. The beetle is thinking, man, there's that ant. He's biting my leg again. Those guys never learn. This beetle has a cannon back near his hind end. He swings it around at the enemy and <laughs> blasts his enemy with 212 degree chemicals. The temperature of boiling water. 
Now, where does a beetle get something 212 degrees? What's he got, a furnace back there? Dude, there's animals that have a body, that have a stable body temperature around 212 degrees, invertebrates, protostomes, uh, annelids, uh, specifically, that live near hydro, uh, polychaete worms, and have a stable body temperature above 200 degrees Fahrenheit. You're just, you're not, you're, you gotta think outside the box. There's environments where it'd be, where this would be cold, where this would be firing cold, a cold blast. <laughs> If you get down by a hydrothermal vent where these polyheat worms and stuff live. Goodness, Kent. Uh, 212 degrees is not beyond the realm of uh, being able to survive biologically, right? It's not. There's there's things that can survive that or have portions of their bodies. That you can touch, you can wave your hand through a flame that's that hot. And it's not, it's not going to cause permanent damage to your hand, right? Uh, but... What causes the heating up is actually super interesting. It's uh, a, a combination of pressure, friction, and uh, chemical reaction. So it's really, it's this nice combination. And there's beetles that do each of these things independently without doing the other. There's ones that do that, that, that fire a, uh, a substance that's, uh, that's noxious but not not heated there's ones that fire uh, a mist that's not really that that, that is heated in in uh and distracting but not really noxious a lot of different different uh uh combinations in uh, and all these things are all there in the beetles as they're evolving along and then this little guy actually manages to uh find the combination uh to get this nice burst that we see now uh, they're, they're not just one species either. There's, this is a whole clade of beetles that do this from around the world. So it's not like unique, like only evolved once in this one species. No, this is, uh, this defense system or variations of this defense system are found across the insect, uh, world and, uh, beetles specifically use these same, uh, queen, uh, yeah, quinones and, uh, peroxide uh, substances, noxious substances, um, basically across the board. So, uh. The ejection system on a bombardier beetle shows basic similarity to the pr propulsion, pulse jet propulsion mechanism of the German V-1 buzz bomb of World War II. What the beetle has evolved is an intermittent explosive process that fires 500 pulses per second. The explosive energy comes from the mixing of two separate fluids, hydroquinones and hydrogen peroxide with oxidative enzymes. The fundamental question, of course... They can actually blast themselves away, too, using this function. This is from 1990, so get a little more, or 97, yeah, 97, 90 and then 97. Um, getting a little more modern, but I don't know when this video is from. This could be from the 90s. Is how can many small random mutations contribute to the development of mechanisms of the pulse jet? It's two fuels, the pumps, the fuel reservoirs, the control system, when only the complete perfected system has survival value. It doesn't, though. Each of the independent parts uh, acts is present in other related beetle species. Uh, all, the, all the pieces are there, so it doesn't uh, only work, only have survival value. Uh, in a in a completed system, we are, I just went over that, uh, that you know there's like the same the same uh, quinones that like a stink like your common stink bug uses right that's that's the same uh, the same chemicals being released through the same mechanisms just uh, not quite as high pressured. Although creationists argue that the theories of evolution and natural selection are unconvincing here. It is still possible that atheistic factors still beyond our ken are operating, and what we really need is a better theory of evolution. <laughs> That's the grasp in its draws. How on earth could a beetle evolve something so complex? What he's got back in his hind end, he has two compartments where he stores these chemicals, hydroquinones and hydrogen uh, peroxide. If yeah. those two get together, they explode. <laughs> False. We know that's not true. We've we, it, you can do that. You can do this little experiment in a lab, right? You know, we know that they don't explode, and that's a that's a false narrative, right? It's actually the 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 uh, chemical reaction needed is only activated when the pressure and friction is applied to 
uh, to trigger the chemical reaction. Then it fires it out. The beetle does not want them to explode in his hind end. That would be uncomfortable. So he has another chemical that he mixes in there. It's called the inhibitor. It prevents the reaction from taking place. But now it doesn't do any good because he sprays it on his enemies and they lick it off and keep chewing off his leg. So he has a fourth chemical that he sprays in at the last possible second. The fourth chemical neutralizes the third chemical and allows the first to explode. You just keep saying chemical. What chemicals are you talking about? It doesn't sound like you know. Is that too complicated? There's four chemicals. The first two explode. The third one makes them not explode. And the fourth one takes away the third one and the first two explode. Now, timing is very important for the beetle. <laughs> if he forgets to put the oh, ha, 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 inhibitor ha. in one time. You got to show that audience laughing history. and enjoying the Hoven ministry. If he puts the neutralizer in too soon, he's got a problem. And this beetle, as it slowly evolved over billions of years, you would hear them exploding in the jungle as they practiced their chemistry. No, it's just, again, all the, all the pieces were there. No need to practice. They already had it. They were born with it. And they would gather together for the funeral. And Grandma would say, kids, take a look at your Uncle Herman. Look at him good, boys and girls. He blew his whole hind end right off. Do you want to die like that? No, Grandma. Well, then quit goofing off and pay attention in school. Someday we're going to be a fire-breathing beetle, you know. <laughs> oh, listen, folks. If you think Bombardier Beetle evolved by chance, you need help. You need to get back to the dragons, bro. You said the dragons breathe fire. You're talking about a Bombardier Beetle spraying liquid. That, uh, even though it's 212 degrees, is not on fire. It's not combusted. I want to know about the combustion. He doesn't know nothing about chemistry. He's never even been to kindergarten. You don't even know the difference between spraying warm, warm liquids and, uh, and a fire and plasma. Uh, you, you, you're going to talk about somebody else not knowing chemistry. You don't even know the two are two, two of the main, uh, the four main states of matter, <laughs> liquid and, uh, and gas, or no, sorry, liquid and plasma <laughs> or gas and plasma. You don't know the difference, right? Because the liquid turns to gas when it, when it's heated, um, but it doesn't turn to plasma. And that's the problem. His whole body is only that big. His brain and you're also talking about it coming out of its, its mouth, right? A dragon's mouth. Uh, the beetle has it away from its, uh, from its feeding apparatus back towards the hind. And now the beetle's breathing. The beetle does do its in, uh, oxygen intake, which is where it gets the oxygen for its, uh, for its hydrogen peroxide. Uh, it, it does take that in on the back end through its spiracles. Um, to, and those are definitely going to have, uh, a part to play in the, the pressurization and oxygenation of the, uh, of the chemicals, but, uh, none of that's going to ex explode, um, c c combust or yeah, combust. Now when it comes to the dragons, again, the mouth where I get, the dragon has to be able to eat and breathe through this, through this pathway, right? And when it breathes in that oxygen, it needs to be able to uh, to absorb that oxygen, right? So now you're going to put uh, so two hundred, even two hundred twelve degrees, like the uh, the bombardier beetle, right? It's good. That would probably cause a lot of tissue damage at that temperature. Um, now you can probably close off the lungs, but when you are dealing with fire, right? You have the problem of convection when it's in when when energy is in a plasma state it causes convection which is which would uh at least in prolonged use more than just short burst of flame uh would cook your lungs just just by convection alone unless the fire was ignited uh outside of the mouth somehow like it was if if the gas it was gas up until it passed the lips and then there was something like some kind of igniter on the face I don't know. Maybe a uh, using the St. Elmo's fire, like the cow horns we talked about earlier, could have caused an electric spark. Maybe it uses St. Elmo's fire to uh, to generate a burst of flame from its mouth. The brain is even smaller. All he knows is if somebody bites you, squirt them. They'll leave. You acknowledge that it's a squirt, that it's liquid. It's squirting liquid. If they're able. It even works on big enemies. Here's a toad about to eat bombardier beetle. Picture number two. Beetle is in the toad's mouth. Picture three, beetle is back out. 
And the toad's tongue is laying on the floor. And he's backing off saying, Woo, somebody call the cook. I hate to be that person, but uh, I don't think that's a toad. I think it's just a frog. Sorry. I think it's just a frog. Look at its little hands. Could be a toad, though. Because toad's not really like a category, right? Toad's like tree. You know, a tree isn't like... There's not a... Uh, an organism that's, 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 oh, that's a tree, because it's, uh, it's almost, trees are almost like a niche, right? Like, uh, they fill this, uh, role of being this tall, uh, cellulose heavy bodied organism, uh, in bamboos and, uh, uh, some grasses, palms. They're not closely related to each other, but they're all trees, or all considered trees. Most of what we consider trees are, well, angiosperms uh but in the past the things that filled the niche of trees are a lot different uh <laughs> you get uh, lycopods and things like that that uh that were a little different but still filled that niche now toads are the same thing they're a group of any group of frogs that has adapted large and, that, and this is even a isn't even a hard fast rule but just in general a group of frogs that have adapted to a terrestrial life life uh, outside of reproduction, right? Um, and they'll generally have drier, uh, wartier skin with a, 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 a <laughs> whereas a, a frog has more uh, uh, generally wetter, uh, it keeps its, its skin wet and it is uh, smoother. But that's not even a rule because things like Suriname toads, right, are, uh, they are <laughs> completely smooth and have weird pores on their backs. And the fire-bellied toads are sort of a, a, like when you think of what a frog is and what a toad is, they're kind of a hybrid between the two because they're green and they live in the water. And, um, but, it, but they also have the toad's uh, knobby skin. So a toad isn't necessarily a, <laughs> a clade in and of itself. It's a, uh, it's a niche that, 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 frogs could, that frogs could evolve into. That's the best way to put it. A toad is a, is a, a niche that frogs can fill. God damn, I like that. Oh. A tree is a niche that plants can fill. Yes. We're going with that. Ugh. Too many jalapenos on that one. Man, we got to lay off this Mexican food for a while. Mm. Okay, my uh, fourth reason for believing in fire-breathing dragons is some of the dinosaurs had strange compartments in their head. Nobody knows for sure what they're for. Reson Parasaurolophus. Resonating chambers. Uh, I always wondered with the para, uh, Parasaurolophus if it was something to uh, heat the air like a Sega antelope. That'd be kind of cool if it lived uh, in like tundra plains and stuff and it needed to heat the air. Just the thought. For, I think it's. I think that they're pretty confident that with parasol office, it was the. Uh, it was a resonating chamber. For instance, had this weird bump on the back of his head. It's an enlargement of his sinus passages. It's hollow, and it's connected to his nasal passages. They call him the hollow-headed dinosaur. Even T. Rex had a head the size of a Volkswagen and the brain the size of a baseball. The rest of it's false. T. Rex's brain was about the same size as mine. Maybe Kent's going to take that and say, nope, it was the size of a baseball. <laughs> Let's see. T-Rex brain mass. Uh, th around 350 grams. So let's convert that to pounds. So, because I'm American and I have to do... So that's about... Uh, 0.75 pounds. Uh, how much does a baseball weigh? That might be, he might be right. <laughs> Kent might have owned me here. How much does a baseball weigh? How much does a baseball weigh? No, it's about twice as heavy as a baseball. Baseball is, uh, 142 grams. And the T-Rex's brain is 350 grams. <laughs> Full of plumbing connected to his sinuses. Which means if he stored chemicals up there, 
He could spray them out his nose or mouth at will, or at anybody, it wouldn't have to be will, but he could spray them out, and it could have been a fire-breathing dragon. It is chemically possible, it is anatomically possible, historically, certainly something happened, because there's an awful lot of history, and Bible says there was one. Now, those are my four reasons. If you got reasons you don't believe in it, I'd be glad to hear them. What was the Next. fourth reason? The chambers, I guess? Okay. Sure, what's here. four? I said, here's his four reasons. Okay, so reason number one, for the Bible tells me so. Reason number two, folklore, which is also the Bible. So you could, uh, for a Christian, I'm sure one and two are different, but for me, one and two are the same. The Bible is just another folklore, a legend about dragons. Uh, so those combined. So now we're down to three. It's it is chemically possible. You have not shown in any way, shape, or form that it is chemically possible for a uh, for an organism to produce combustion. You you just have it. Uh, you've shown that we can that we can uh, organisms can produce uh, gas emissions, but we already knew that. And I've been I might I think I released some gas emissions during during your freaking conversation here. Um, so that's not yet didn't show that so now we're down to just the two and the last one is dinosaur had dinosaurs had strange compartments in their head which i am going to give you i'm going to give you that one that they have strange compartments in their head that we don't fully understand we understand a lot better now than we what we understood back in 2006 though uh which is when pz said this video was could be no later than 2006 i'm going to believe pz because no, he was he he was around back then in the community. Whereas uh, in 2006, I was a musician. <laughs> Didn't even know who Kent Hovind was back then. Uh, yeah, but I'll give you the strange head compartments. Uh, Parasolophus did have some strange head compartments, uh, and other uh, obviously that's the one that stands out. But other uh, hadrosaurs had other had different head ornaments. Pterosaurs had different head ornaments. Do you think he thinks that pterosaurs breathe fire too? And does he think that the uh, combustion organ exists inside the this weird bump. inside the skull, like the chambers with chemicals? Uh, does it blast the, the fire out of its nostrils or out of its mouth? Middle passage, cross section chain through the, yeah. So this is like a, what it reminds me of when I look at this is a trombone. Doesn't it remind you of a trombone? Let me see. Parasolophus. Yeah, and they got pictures of one playing a trombone. I thought there was a some of the. I, there, I, I've seen a graph showing the comparison between the Parasolophus um, chambers and the. It might have been a trumpet, actually. Was it a trumpet? Um. Chambers. <laughs> I don't know how it spelled that. It said spelled Chumbers. I'm just trying to get a better diagram of it than what we got here from from the science gent. I don't know how you can call yourself a gent when you're, uh, yeah, when you're a dirty, rotten. Oh, all right. Well, anyway, back to what uh, the main point of this was uh, that. In this isn't like anything new. It's new soon to me. It's from 2017. Mark Mark Reed shared this with me uh, when we were talking in a backstage chat uh, about this argument. He said that a young Earth creationist had recently sent him this as evidence for fire breathing dragons. Now, this from the Skeptical Inquirer is very much an article debunking fire-breathing uh, dinosaurs. <laughs> In support of the idea that 
Real animals can produce fire. Gish cited the defense mechanism of the bombardier beetle, which sprays a mixture of hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone into the face of would-be predators. Chemical catalyst caused the mixture to reach 100 degrees Celsius. Subsequent YEC authors followed Gish's lead, added imaginary details such as a spark or ex uh, explosion or flame. In reality, the beetles nearly spray hot liquid, which scalds but does not produce flame, therefore provides no biological precedent for organic fire production. Some YEC authors have cited bioluminescent animals and electric eels as biological precedent for fire production. However, the process that produces uh, bioluminescence is bioelectrogenesis, are chemically unrelated to combustion and generate little to no thermal energy. The processes are therefore irrelevant to fire production and provide no biological precedent for it. Proponents of the fire-breathing dinosaur hypothesis have suggested a number of potential mechanisms of fire production. Review below each of these separate hypotheses in their own right. Below, I use the scientific data to evaluate each hypothesis. Each uh, such hypothesis implicitly predicts that the mechanism is not only physically possible, but it will not cause serious injury to the animal. Each hypothesis is falsified if either of those predictions is not met. So we got Henry Morris and James Gilmer in uh, 84 and 2011, respectfully, uh, suggest that fire production or fire producing reptiles could breathe out gases that would ignite upon contact with oxygen. A substance that ignites upon contact with air is said to be pyrophoric. When released into the air from a container, a pyrophoric gas explodes after traveling only a few centimeters or millimeters from the opening. The wider the opening, the nearer the explosion occurs. For example, a pyrophoric gas silane, uh, silane, I think that's how you say that, silane, might be silane, I don't, I don't know. Uh, someone correct me, I think it's silane though. Um, doo -doo -doo. Generates an explosion uh, 5 to 80 millimeters from the, the mouth of a tube, 4.32 millimeters in diameter, and 5 to 30 millimeters from the mouth of a tube, 3.5 millimeters in diameter. Giving that pyrophoric gas released from the nostrils or throat of a large dinosaur are an opening greater than a few millimeters in diameter would have exploded immediately, burning the animal's face or throat. <laughs> Serious harm that this would cause the animal falsifies the fire production hypothesis. The hypothesis could be tenable if the nostrils were protected by a flame resistant tissue, but the animal produces uh, but animals produce no such tissue. Many animals produce heavy keratinized epidermal derivatives, hairs, feathers, horn sheaths, uh, that protect from abrasion, but these burn when exposed to fire, as do cuticles or of collagen or chitin. If dinosaur snouts produced a protective non-flammable mineral covering, calcium carbonate or calcium phosphate, this covering would have fossilized. If it, as is uh, usual with hard animal parts, no such covering is present on the snout of any dinosaur fossils. Right? There you go. Ignition of belched methane. Herbivorous animals or herbivorous mammals emit uh, eructations, belches of methane daily, averaging 26 uh, per hour in cattle and 42 per hour in sheep. John Morris suggests that herbivorous dinosaurs did likewise and secreted a pyrophoric material from glands to ignite their belched methane. However, once liberated from a container such as a dinosaur's oral or nasal cavity, a gas immediately spreads in all directions. 
the methane would quickly surround the dinosaur's head. The pyrophoric gas would not only produce a nasal or oral burn as it emerged from emerge, but it would ignite the cloud of methane infused air around the animal's head, burning the surface of the head and the resulting fireball. The serious harm that this would have caused falsifies the fire production hypothesis. Humans, human cases confirm that ignition from combustion Combustible belches causes facial burns. Eructation, that's a fun word, eructation, that's burping, I guess, in humans is, usually involves the emission of swallowed air, which is methane-free and non-combustible. However, in adult cases of pyloric stenosis, combustible gases can accumulate in the stomach due to the fermentation of food in the stomach when the passage to the duodenum is obstructed, which when a patient belches those gases while smoking, the lit cigarette ignites the gases resulting in a fireball cause, causes facial burns. Eek! That's from 1954, um, Galley 1954 and McDonald 1994. And I want to know more about that because it sounds like it could be related to spontaneous human combustion, which is interesting in and of itself uh maybe a topic for cryptic corner in the future or just even a uh sci fails honestly ignition of methane by an electric organ several spish 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 spishes several fish species have electric organs made of modified muscle cells called electrocytes which are arranged in a in series so that the voltages are summed. Let's see, that's Gallant 2014, Siler 2016. Most electric fish species generate weak, harmless pulses that are used to navigate, detect other fish, and convey social signals. In contrast, electric eels, Electrophorus electricus, and the torpedo ray, torpedo species, uh, produce pulses strong enough to stun prey, Siler 2016, or cause harm or death in humans, Copenhaver uh, 91, Carlson 2015. De Young uh, 2000 and Gilmer 2011 proposed that dinosaurs possess an electric organ as in the electric eel and use it to generate a spark to ignite metabolically produced methane. However... As we have seen, ignition of belched methane would envelop the animal's head in a fireball. Also, electric organs do not produce sparks. The spark in an electric, electrical, electrical discharge into air, the permittivity, a measure of how easily electric currents flow through material of air and of methane are both low, approximately one. <laughs> uh, in this Wolfarth 2013, uh, whereas in the water is over 60 from Harvey 2013. For this reason, current generated by an electric fish travel easily through the water or through biological tissue, which is mostly water, but not through air or methane. Because electrical current follows the path of least resistance, current flows from one part of the animal to another will flow through the animal's tissue and will not jump and uh, will not jump an air field filled or methane filled gap between body parts as a spark. For example, if a dinosaur had sufficient voltage between its upper and lower jaw for an electric current to flow from one jaw to the other, the dinosaur opened his mouth and belched some methane. No spark would leap into the methane cloud. Instead, the current would flow from one jaw to the other through the dinosaur's jaw muscles. Uh, there would be no spark, flames, or any other visible evidence that the electrical event had occurred. This fire production hypothesis, therefore, is falsified. Mm -hmm. So that's falsifying the 
methane gas is going to explode a fireball in his face or in his, in his, in his nose. Going to uh, result in burns, extensive burns, or no result at all because the electrical organ sends the electrical charge through the jaws and not between the gap. No current to flow. That's not how electric electricity works. Ignition of fuel by a spark produced by friction. Gilmer hypothesized that a dinosaur could use friction to produce sparks to ignite a combustible gas such as methane in the mouth, throat, or internal organs. However, no animal produces any material that creates sparks in response to friction. The tough material that, an that and the tough the tough materials that animal bodies make calcium phosphate calcium carbonate chitin and keratinized in uh integumentary derivatives derivatives do not spark when rubbed together flint which produces a spark when rubbed together is formed from silica a chemical that some microbes can precipitate however even if flint producing microbes inhabited dinosaur mouth or throat, any methane ignited there would explode there, causing serious internal injury. <laughs> Seems to be a recurring factor that this dinosaur is going to hurt itself with its exploding organs. Internal organs uh, are anoxic environments and therefore do not allow flame production. The one exception to this rule is the respiratory tract, but flame generation here causes severe injury or death, Walmart 2010. Even the digestive tract has too little O2 for it to support a flame. <laughs> Levy, 1954, uh, Kuhn Ha, 2011. Uh, this hypothesis is therefore falsified. Yeah, I want to know the person who, who said, who did the experiments to see if they could keep a flame burning in the digestive tract. That's wild. Emissions of hypergolic pair of chemicals. Uh, yeah. Isaac Batdorf, Porch, and Lacey, 2010-2013, and uh, respectfully, hypothesized that dinosaurs could produce fire by emitting a pair of chemicals that would ignite in the air upon contact with each other after being sprayed from the mouth or nose. The pair of chemicals that spontaneously ignite when combined without a separate ignition source is termed hypergolic. A hypergolic pair of chemicals includes a fusion chemical and an oxidizing chemical. Numerous hypergolic pairs of chemicals are known, but most such chemicals are man-made and either do not occur in nature or, as in the case of liquid oxygen, must be chilled to a temperature that the animal's body cannot withstand. The two exceptions are hydrogen peroxide as an oxidizer and ammonia as a fuel, both of which are produced by organisms. However, the fuels with which hydrogen peroxide is hypergolic, kerosene, pentaborane, or mixtures including hydrazine plus methanol, set in 2006, are extremely toxic to organisms. Otherwise, the oxidizers with which ammonia is hypergolic, liquid oxygen, and liquid fluorine have boiling, boiling points too low, which is negative 183 degrees Celsius, 188 degrees Celsius, respectfully. Um, Hammond, for organisms to withstand their presence as a liquid, uh, there is therefore no known hypergolic pair of chemicals uh, the production of which an organism could withstand. Furthermore, emission of a pair of hypergolic chemicals would harm the animal in one of one or both if one or both chemicals is gaseous because a gas diffusion is likely <laughs> in all directions immediately upon release. <laughs> Again, the fireball wrap in the head, right? A pair of gaseous hypergols would surround the dinosaur's head and envelop it in a fireball. <laughs> as they reacted to each other. Uh, if one hypergol were gaseous and the other liquid, then upon release, the gaseous hypergol would immediately spread in all directions and reach the liquid hypergol's point of exit from the body. Burning the animal in the location, uh, these ver versions of the hypergol hypothesis are therefore falsified. If both chemicals were liquid, 
they would have to be sprayed at such an angle that the two streams would converge uh, sufficiently far from the animal not to burn it. However, this version of the hypothesis is nonetheless falsified by the lack of any pair of hypergol chemicals in the presence of, bo of both of which the animal's body can withstand. Yeah, so there you go. There's that one. Lambiosaurine dinosaur crest. The duck-billed dinosaurs of the subfamily Lambiosaurines have hollow crest and in several YEC publications, including seventh grade biology textbooks published by BJU Press. Yes, this stuff is in textbooks, people. This is in school curriculum. BJU Press, that's Bat Dwarf and Porch, 2013, Lacey, 2014, or 2013. The crusts are interpreted as storage and mixing chambers for combustible gases. Gish, 97, Peterson, 86, Morris, 88, Nearman, 94, DeYoung, 2000, Peterson again in 2002. However, the crusts, hollow passages are part of the respiratory tract. Uh, Evans, 2009. Anything stored or mixed there would have obstructed the airflow, causing suffocation. In addition, the left and right passage are separate, which precludes mixing, except in a rear compartment that houses the olfactory epithelium. Anything mixed and combusted there would have destroyed the animal's sense of smell, in addition to causing internal burns. Yeah. Not going to work that way, is it? Connected to each of the left and right nasal passages in the lambiosaurine skull is a lateral diver, diverticulum. Diverticulum? Yeah. A blind sac extending upward from the nasal cavity. Evans, 2009. The diverticulum is lateral in the airway so the that a gland or storage facility housed there would not obstruct the airway. However, in today's archosaurs, crocodilians and birds, uh, diverticula for, from the nasal passage houses only air, no glands, no storage structure. That's from Whitmer 97 and Whitmer and Rid Rid Ridgely 2008. Uh, furthermore, fire production methods involving lambiosaurine lateral diverticula would have injured the animal. If the lateral diverticula housed glands that released pyrophoric chemicals into the air the respiratory, in the respiratory passage, this would have generated combustion inside the crust, causing internal burns. If a duct conducted pyrophoric chemicals uh, to the nostril, ensuring the combustion occurred outside the crust, the tissue around the nostrils would suffer burns. If each lateral diverticulum housed a gland that produced one of the pair of hypergolic gases, then upon exiting the nostrils, the gases would diffuse in all directions, combustions enveloping the animal's snout or possibly entire head once again in a fireball. If each lateral diverticulum uh, <laughs> diverticulum that word's going to kill me housed a gland that produced one of a pair of hypergolic liquids rather than gases and if ducks conducted ducks conducted I like that too <laughs> it's got the word ducks in it the liquids to the nostrils and if the liquids were projected by muscular squeezing and if the two streams of liquid converged far enough beyond the snout to avoid burning it when the two streams contacted each other and ignited then the animal might have avoided injury however there are no bony indications of the presence of requisite or requisite glands ducts or muscles in the lambiosaurian uh, skull moreover there is no pair of hypergolic chemicals for which you know animal bodies can withstand the production of both. This hypothesis, therefore, is falsified. Moving right along to cartilaginous blasting caps. Isaac, 2010, hypothesized that dinosaurs possessed chunks of cartilage that extended beyond the bony snout, as in mammals, 
and may have housed a mixing region for chemical and oxygen use in combustion. However, nasal cartilage uh, cartilages do not host fire production mechanisms in known animals. More important, if cartilaginous chunk host combustion, the structures would have suffered burns. This falsifies the hypothesis. Other Mesozoic reptiles. Booker, 2005, hypothesized the enlarged cavity at the tip of the snout of Cretaceous crocodiliform Sarcosuchus housed a fire source. Uh, Wyland in 2005 and Paul in 2010 suggested the cavity was used to mix combustible gases. Uh, in the seventh grade biology textbook, Batdorf, Porch 2013, and Lacey 2013 also implied that this cavity was used for fire production. The appearance of a large, of an enlarged cavity at the tip of the snout in adult Sarcosuchus is due to the development of the widening snout. In Sarcosuchus juveniles, there are uh, narrow snouts and the entire length of the snout widens during development. So that the snout tip is widened not by itself, but along with the rest of the snout. The wide adult snout tip is therefore developmentally related to the width of the snout as a whole, not to any special function of the snout tip. Narrow snout crocodilians eat fish nearly exclusively, whereas medium to wide snout species are generalist predators with a diet that includes large prey. Uh, McHenry 2006, this change in snout uh, proportion in Sarcosuchus is therefore functionally related to a dietary switch as the animal grew. Widening of the snout in, in combination with the lack of bony internarial bars between the nostrils years, yields the illusion of an enlarged cavity at the snout's tip of the Sarcosuchus. Most extent crocodilian species, it's called a bola in most species, are in uh, garials and gavels. False garials, Tomiceas. Most uh, extent crocodilian species lack a bony internal bar and instead possess soft, a soft tissue septum that separates the nostrils. Uh, that's from Iodinsky, 73. There is no reason to suspect otherwise in Sarcosuchus. So the, a single enlarged cavity is very unlikely in the fleshed out animal, even if it had existed production of fire within it would have burned the animal which has which this which falsifies this hypothesis once again we're just burning through them burning through this uh some nonsense here thank you for sticking around everybody this is fun i really like reading this article with you guys um, Gilmer 2011 hypothesized that the crest of some pterosaurs such as pteranodon could store flammable gases for use on demand. This hypothesis is anatomically unrealistic. In some crusted pterosaurs, it is possible that the crest contained air-filled diverticula uh, of the nasal cavity or the middle ear cavity, but the crests are extremely thin in cross sections which, with insufficient room for storage and in extent archosaurs, the nasal diverticula contains only air, Whitmer again, and Whitmer and Ridgely again. Furthermore, the pterodon itself, there is no indication that the frontal bones, which make up the entire crest, uh, as invaded by the nasal diverticula, <laughs> there's that word again, in the first place. The hypothesis is therefore falsified. Uh, flame-throwing gators sounds like an amazing twist on golf. Yeah, or like a like a sequel to Sharknados, fire gators, wildfire gators, something. Yeah, the real origin of dragon legends. The biological reality behind the origins of dragon legends has long been known. The word dragon is derived from the ancient Greek, uh, which is dracon, in the Latin draco, both of which means which meant serpent. Many ancient Greeks and Romans artifacts depict dracon, dracon or draco myth, and 
in all of which depict the animal is a snake. Greek and Romans worked uh, works of natural history describe the dra uh, Draco as a snake. Some such works uh, restricted the term to large non-venomous constrictors, especially the Esculpian snake, uh, Zeminus longissima, or African and Indian python. That's uh, from Center 2013 and 16. European dragon lore evolved in the Middle Ages. Rumors that dragons could fly and could produce fire had begun by the 5th century. By the 10th century, dragons were routine, routinely depicted with feathered wings and a pair of limbs. Depictions of dragons as quadrupeds with bat-like wings began in the 13th century and became common during the Renaissance. By the time 19th century naturalists gave dinosaurs their first scientific descriptions, European artists had been regularly portraying dragons with uncannily dinosaurian or pterosaurian appearances for about four centuries. Speculations that humans encountered these animals had inspired dragon legends naturally followed. And YEC literature now routinely portrays dinosaurs as fire breathers. But as shown here, that is unrealistic and it can, its continuance in science textbooks is downright irresponsible. So here's all those freaking citations. Look at all these citations. This is from Philip Center, and he cited his own work up there. Yeah. But I want to see what this snake is, because that name didn't sound familiar to me. Zeminensis longissima. Let's see. Oh, got a copy it. Come on, copy, copy. Ooh, pretty snake. As if I was going to say any snake wasn't pretty. As if. Oh, so pretty. Looks like it's mostly brown, gray, and black. A little bit yellow around the face. Cute. Yeah. All right. So... That was Psy Fails. We revisited uh, Kent Hoven and the silly, silly claim that uh, <laughs> the dinosaurs breathe fire. Uh, please uh, remember to be kind, take care, and we'll see you next time.